so yeah, like Galen said, um, I'm gonna try and give a perspective from my experience in the business world, um, specifically in energy and alternative energy. Um, let's see, I'll just give a brief outline of what I'm gonna talk about. I, I kind of, I'm gonna weave around a little bit, but hopefully it is somewhat consistent um, with what we've been talking about so far today. Um, I'll give a little bit of background about myself, um, talk a little bit about my experience in the energy business, uh, and the importance I feel in using the right metrics and the right language to communicate issues in the business world, uh, specifically relating to environmentalism and alternative energy. Uh, one example that I'll talk about is Envy, a, a fuel cell motorcycle that I, I worked on. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about connecting the dots <coughs> and linking issues together to make, to basically to achieve relevance, which I think is really important to uh, affecting change and um, maybe propose one idea, one concept for uh, leveling the playing field a little bit for energy. So a little bit of background about myself, um, personal, educational, and, and professional. Um, in coming up with a topic to talk about, I thought a lot about what role I play in the organizations that I've been involved with, and I often have a hard time clearly defining my role not to mention my value, but one thing that I think I've done consistently is tried to make environmental issues relevant while being in the business world. And it's a tough line to walk, but I, I think I do a decent job of kind of walking um, both sides on both sides of the fence. So I thought, it'd be pers uh, I thought it would help this week's discussions um, to give you a little personal background, which a few people have done already, um, basically to help make things relevant. So I grew up in Colorado. I grew up um, hiking and fishing and backcountry skiing in the Colorado Rockies. Um, my father uh, took me on uh, lots of trips into the, uh, the flat tops of Colorado, into the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, and uh, I would love to go fishing with my grandfather on Black Mesa and in the gold medal wa waters of the Colorado River. Um, my grandfather, Dr. James Keith, was a world-renowned wildlife biologist who devoted a good part of his career to saving the brown pelican from extinction and banning the pesticide DDT. <clears throat> so I grew up hearing all about environmental devastation uh, occurring in the natural world. And I also saw my, my father, William Porter, um, devote his life and his career to environmentalism and try to put together a business building solar adobe homes, uh, capitalizing in, on his many years in the uh, construction industry. So I've sort of stood on both sides of the fence. Um, I received my, uh, my BS in chemical engineering from UC Berkeley with an emphasis in environmental technology. After I graduated, I went on to work um, in, uh, in hydrogen generation. And in 2002, I co-founded a company with two other colleagues based on a next generation technology for hydrogen production. Uh, that company was acquired in 2003 by Intelligent Energy, which is a, a global fuel cell leader, um, I like to claim, uh, headquartered in London. <laughs> and our group was acquired because we were one of the few independent technical teams in the world working on fuel processor systems for fuel cells. And our flagship product um, was called Hestia, is a hydrogen generation system named after the Greek god goddess of the hearth. Um, the system is about the size of a refrigerator, and it produces uh, pure hydrogen from a, a variety of hydrocarbon fuels, including liquid fuels such as ethanol and biodiesel, into a pure hydrogen um, stream. And the system is designed for power generation, for distributed power generation, and for vehicle uh, refueling, for on-site refueling of fuel cell vehicles. Another major project that I worked on at Intelligent Energy is the NV motorcycle. Um, I'm sort of curious, has anyone in the room seen this picture or heard of the NV motorcycle? One? Yeah, cool. I'm, I'm sort of curious because it has gotten a, a decent amount of, of coverage. We were on the Today Show and we won some awards from Time Magazine and Business Week and some other things. So I'm always, we think that it's, you know, widely known, but <laughs> of course, no. <laughs> I, I would hope that this exactly. would be, though, so. the problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, I'm in a bit of a transition. I'm, I'm actually moving away from hydrogen and fuel cells and into uh, to biofuels. Uh, and I'll mention more about this transition, but one of the realizations that I've come to is that I've spent a whole lot of time, um, I think it's, it sort of resonates with some of the discussion about being a scientist and trying to, to communicate. Uh, I spend a lot of time just talking about energy and hydrogen and, and why it's important and why it makes sense and, and 
it's basically a very complex argument. And my conclusion is that if you argue enough, it doesn't really matter if you win. The fact that you had to argue so much, you've already lost. So, um, especially when you're talking about adopting some new technology. So, um, I feel that bio, I feel that uh, hydrogen makes the most sense uh, on the back of a biofuel infrastructure, a liquid infrastructure that's already renewable. And so, I've decided to focus my, my efforts on that effort initially and try and make a little more change in the near term. Um, so, sort of a technology and implementation company. Um, so, because I spend so much of my time making these economic and technical uh, cases for renewable fuels and hydrogen, I thought I'd present some of the highlights of what I've learned trying to push sustainable energy um, and sustainability as a concept uh, in the business world. Most people, surprisingly, that are potential customers of energy technology actually seem to know very little about just the fundamentals of energy. So I like to start with just the very fundamentals. Um, I, I generally start topics with the, the first law of thermodynamics, just the, the simple fact that energy is uh, not created or destroyed, it's always conserved. And it's a simple enough concept, but if you ask the average person on the street where energy comes from, where their gasoline comes from, where their electricity comes from, you'd be amazed at what kind of answers you get. Most people don't see energy past the light socket or past the gasoline pump. Um, you turn on the pump, you turn on the light, it works. And that's basically the end of most people's thoughts about, about energy. And it's changing more recently as oil goes up. Now it's affecting people's pocketbooks more and they're, they're more concerned about it. Um, I teach a, a science class for some junior high school students in, in Long Beach. And one of the first assignments I, I like to give is uh, to ask them, um, to go home and, and ask their parents, where does the energy that they use every day come from? And just to see what kind of answers they come back with. And it's really funny to, to see um, what people say, but it's amazing how many kids actually kind of get it right, that really all of our energy comes from the sun, and it's a, it's a closed system, and we only have what we, what we get from the sun. Uh, we happen to have a bunch of savings stored up in the ground in the form of you know, coal and oil and other things, probably not telling anyone uh, anything they don't already know, but... Um, I like to think of it as savings, that it's, it's stored up energy accumulated over millions of years. From a business perspective, it's our startup capital. Um, you can't just go spending it unless you're spending it to eventually achieve profitability or sustainability. And um, that kind of makes sense with business people. They can understand, oh, I, that is kind of true. If I just spend my savings, eventually I'll, I'm going to run out. Um, but it's, it's funny that that simple concept is, is hardly widely accepted. Um, the CEO of Chevron Texaco, for example, was on uh, Charlie Rose recently, and Charlie Rose asked him the simple question, do you believe that the, our oil resources are finite? And he couldn't admit it, and he was dodging the question, it's debatable, it's being produced, it's being consumed, it's very complicated. And so if you can't even start with that basic assumption that there's a fixed amount of resources and we're using them faster than they're being created, um, so it's therefore by definition our savings and it's unsustainable, uh, it's hard to make progress. So. My basic point is that we have a, a, a tough case to make for alternatives um, if we can't even start with fundamental assumptions. So to help explain some of these more complex concepts um, in, in energy, we need metrics to talk about them. And I think it's really important what metrics we use when we're communicating because uh, it, it makes a big difference, I think. Um, it's sort of like the, the use of metaphor. I think it, it can impact the... Uh, um, the interpretation of the information tremendously. So some new things you see now in, in cars, they put miles per gallon on the display. It tells you how, how, what miles per gallon you're getting. In hybrids, there's a, a full graphical display that says you know, your efficiency pattern over the last you know, few, however many miles. And those little things make a big difference because now consumers are they're competing with themselves to get better mileage. They talk online. They post their results on blogs. And it, it just starts, the metrics kind of define the, the, the um, the conversation to a certain degree. So we have miles per gallon, dollars per kilowatt. It's just a metric that helps us compare cost of electricity, um, solar versus coal. Um, kilograms of CO2 per kilometer is, a, is just another metric. It's similar to miles per gallon. It's just a measure of efficiency of the car. Um, so why would we need two metrics for the same basic concept? And I, I think it's an interesting thing just to think about for a second that our EPA right now is, is testifying to the Supreme Court that CO2 should not be a regulated emission. But in, meanwhile, in Europe, it's already on the stickers of every car sold. 
So it's, it's, you know, we're debating whether, you know, there's no other uh, metrics of emissions on any car. In, in Europe, it's just CO2. They don't talk about NOx or PM or any other emissions, just CO2. And we're still debating whether it should be regulated. Um, so I think the debate is really important, and, I, and the science definitely matters. Um, but uh, it's one thing we, we talk a lot about, uh, we've talked a lot about so far. We can talk a lot. Uh, we could all sit around in this room and talk for the rest of the decade. But change starts by taking action and, and doing. And doing starts with getting buy-off. And buy-off starts with listening and understanding the basic tenets of communication. And communication requires language and metrics. Um, so I think I was invited to this conference to give some perspective from the business world. And so I don't want to sound like a, a heartless capitalist, but in business, um, there's only one ma metric that really matters, and it's dollars. And more dollars is better, and less dollars is worse. It's very easy to compare different things on that basis. And unfortunately, this metric def defines a lot about what happens and what doesn't happen. Um, I think one of the interesting images that Al Gore presented in his latest film was this picture of this image of scales with the earth on one side and gold on the other, as if there's this zero-sum trade-off between uh, the economy and the environment. And I think it's a very important concept because it shows um, a, a, a concept that environmentalists have, have sort of lost to the capitalists, that it's, there's this trade-off. And so one of the things that, that I think is really important is to combat that and to try and break that, that inverse relationship that's been established. So to get people to, in business to care about environmental issues, they have to see how it affects their bottom line. And unfortunately, Wall Street has yet to recognize triple bottom line benefits, so all we're left with is really one, which is economic. And so I was a little hesitant to go in this direction because I think it's important to, um, to question your assumptions and is this really what we want to do is prove that environmentalism can be profitable. Um, it, it may not necessarily be the right approach, but I think it's a, it's a worthwhile exercise that can yield some interesting results. So I think for purposes of discussion, it's sort of worth the risk. So a direct example of how I've tried to use metrics creatively to sell something that I think is a net positive for the environment. <clears throat> And a triple win on a triple bottom line basis is um, this product, the NV uh, motorcycle. NV stands for Emissions Neutral Vehicle, um, and it was a it was a product project that uh, Intelligent Energy uh, wanted to do to showcase the benefits of their fuel cell technology. And so um, I was lucky enough to be a part of this this uh, project team from the inception of the the concept. And um, when we sat down and started thinking about this. We said, well, conventional thinking would suggest that to build a fuel cell motorcycle, you just take a regular motorcycle. There's lots that are built, and you take the engine out and you put a fuel cell in. And if we had done this, we had, would have had to compete head-to-head -head with technology that's been around for 100 years and had the benefits of extreme mass manufacturing. And there's basically no way you can win on a cost basis or even a durability basis with this approach. So you, know, you, you can see that on a cost basis, it's, it's, we're nowhere close. So we asked, well, what else do we have with a fuel cell that a gasoline engine doesn't have? And one thing that we have is useful DC electricity. And so we wanted to highlight this difference by making the core of the bike, the fuel cell power generator, which sits right about there, removable. And so this allows us to remove the fuel cell and you can use it for something else useful. You could power a laptop, you can provide backup power for your house, um, you could use power remote telemetry equipment, something like that. So essentially, we tried to avoid a direct comparison by using different metrics and change the value pitch. So one analogy is the iPod, which is an example of that this change in metrics has sort of succeeded. When people first heard of Steve Jobs selling a musical player for $500, when CD players were $50, I think a lot of people thought he was nuts. Why would someone pay so much more just to have more songs? It's not like there's a lot of consumers out there that are complaining, I just don't have enough songs in my CD player. Um, but what he did is he came up with a whole new way of delivering music, not just listening to music, and he created it in such a way that it was a sleek fashion statement that appealed to sort of basic human nature, and he delivered a, a comprehensive music solution, not just a, a simple product. So that's kind of what we tried to do with, with this, is deliver a transportation solution by coupling this bike to our hydrogen generator. Um, so you can see on a direct comparison, it, it wouldn't make much sense to to try, and, um, to try and sell this. For one, the engine costs way more per kilowatt, so if you wanted to compare two engines with the same power, ours would be way more expensive. Durability isn't as good. 
Hydrogen's more than three times more expensive, so the fuel's more expensive. People are already complaining about fuel costs at $3 a gallon. Uh, it's a tough sell. So what we did is we said, well, let's try and, and actually capture some of the value of the efficiency of the fuel cell, what we have that's uh, unique. And so how we did this is, um, it's nothing, it's not rocket science, but it's just kind of changing the perspective, <coughs> which is to say, uh, instead of saying that, that this bike is, uh, requires $10 per gallon fuel, what we did is we downsized the, downsized the fuel cell as much as possible, so it's only a one kilowatt fuel cell. So the initial capital cost isn't as high, and we hybridized it uh, with six kilowatts of batteries so that the cost of the fuel cell wasn't as relevant. And we also, rather than talking about the cost of our fuel on a dollars per gallon basis, what we did is we tried to talk about it more on a dollars per tank basis. So instead of talking about $10 per gallon, it's actually only $1.45 to fill up the tank and you'll go 100 miles. So it's, it sounds simple enough, but what you've done just by changing the metrics a little bit is you've, you've captured the customer's attention. So this is a stark contrast to the SUV driver that says, well, it cost me $100 to fill up my SUV. This sounds interesting. So at least you've, you've captured their attention and you can take the next step in trying to you know, kind of make the sale. How much does it cost to buy? Um, I'll, I'll show you in the next, the next slide here. So, so now with maybe a new metric and, and this sort of solutions approach instead of just a product approach, um, the comparison looks a little bit better. Um, because hydrogen is also not readily available, that's another major hurdle. I mean, who's going to buy a bike for hydrogen? Where are you going to get the hydrogen? So now what we do is um, we actually package our hydrogen generators with the fuel cell bike, and, uh, and now it's, it's a solution for fleets. Different city fleets across the world are interested. And so you buy one of our systems and, say, 50 bikes or 20 bikes, and you've got your whole solution now. And if you use our hydrogen generator to make the hydrogen, it only costs about 50 cents to fill up because our technology is so efficient uh, in making hydrogen. It's much more efficient than um, what the, the chemical industry does driving it around in bottles. So now the comparison with a regular scooter. Uh, regular scooter, major source of pollution in the developing world. You're still dependent on oil. It's sort of 20th century technology. With this solutions approach, we have distributed hydrogen generation, so it makes hydrogen more ubiquitous, more available. It's also a mobile power source, something that the, the scooter is not. Um, maybe there's additional utility. Maybe it's sort of a cultural thing like iPods that we haven't even thought of how consumers might want to use that, that power. Um, there's zero point source emissions at where the, where the bike is. There's, of course, emissions potentially created with the generation of the hydrogen, but where the bike is, where the dense populations are, there's no emissions. It's a liquid-fueled hydrogen generator, so you can use biofuels for low CO2, net CO2 emissions. $1.45 for tanks sounds great. Actually, 50 cents a tank if you use the Hestia system. And the bike costs about $7,000. So now you've got something that maybe this makes sense. So we took a, a set of really tough, basic, you know, from a scientific, analytical, engineering perspective, how can you possibly make this thing work, and tried to em uh, emphasize the things that, that do work well for us. And, uh, and focus on those. Um, Grace, how much does a typical scooter? Yeah. Uh, it's five thousand dollars, something. It's it's in the same ballpark. It's cheaper, but you know, in the same ballpark. Um, <coughs> one of my um, heroes is Amory Lovins. He talks a lot about solutions, the solutions business model, and how it's good for business and good for the environment. Um, and uh, it's helped kind of inspire me to think of different ways of, of offering products. Uh, just another example of how this can work. <clears throat> I don't know if anyone's heard of this example, but there's a, a carpet company called Interface um, that changed their whole business model away from just selling carpet to offering a flooring solution. And it sounds like maybe it's just cheesy uh, you know, consulting speak, but um, what they do now is they actually provide a, a service to you. You will always have a good carpet. And so previously when, you know, if, if if I was the manager of this building and this one strip of carpet wore out, I'd have to replace all the carpet because it was made in these giant rolls. Um, and as soon as one piece wears out, you got to replace all of it. What Interface tried to do is, is by providing the solution, as they came up with innovative ways of, of making their products more recyclable or more usable, they captured the benefits. So um, they designed their carpets to be in tiles. So now 
Um, I, most carpets now that you'll find are actually installed in tiles so that if one section wears out, you just replace that one section that's worn out and not the whole thing. And because they provide the service, they capture the benefit as they make their carpet more recyclable. When they go and rip out the old carpet, it's now their carpet to recycle, so they capture those benefits. So it's a, it's a way that you can get a win-win solution for business and for the environment. Um, and I think it's a really smart way to, uh, to think about problems, especially in business. Um, in the, uh, the paper that, that Sue sent out, The Death of Environmentalism, the authors talked about uh, David Brower's attempts to think creatively about win-win solutions, and specifically those relating to taxation. So I thought I'd give an example of what I see to be a win-win solution enabled by connecting the dots. Can you go back for one second? What was the cost of the hydrogen generator? You haven't shared that with us. Uh, about $50,000. Oh, okay. But it's not necessary to use the most. Unless you want to fill it up. <laughs> I mean, you could get hydrogen from some other place. It's not no, proprietary. So that's but. a cost of 50000 okay. Yeah, but I mean, the buy guy buying the scooter doesn't have to pay for the gas station he fills up at. So you had to know where one of those is to go fill them. Exactly. Or as a city trying to you know, build out infrastructure, they can buy one. And now they California building a hydrogen highway, okay. that type of thing. Um, so I wanted to talk about maybe a, a concept uh, that, that I talk a lot about in alternative energy. And I think quite possibly one of the most important issues facing alternative energy is cost competitiveness with conventional energy sources. Um, I think a good question to ask is what's the real cost of gasoline? Um, so at the pump what we pay, it's, it's $4 a gallon. It's pretty cheap. Most people don't think it's cheap, but it is pretty cheap. Money's pretty cheap, too. You can get 0% APR on new cars today. Um, and at the pump, you know, you see big cars. Big cars mean more American. I, there's been some recent ads by Hummers where, you know, if someone makes you mad, you just go buy a Hummer. It's the, it's the sort of, it's the American way, right? Um, so I think an important question to ask is, is this true? Is this a real cost? Are alternative energy technologies really more expensive than conventional energy? What if we include social and environmental costs? What if we just do some fair and honest accounting? So if we, uh, if we actually look at some of the real costs, there's been lots of analysis done on this. Um, one group in, in Washington, D.C. came out with a study in 1998 that said the real cost was $15 a gallon. Um, that was in 1998, by the way. Which I think gasoline was under $2 a gallon then. Uh, we spend about $50 a year just protecting uh, our oil supplies in the Middle East. It's very well documented. Uh, even the uh, Energy Information Administration estimates that last year we exported about $350 billion um, to oil producing countries. It's, it's a billion dollars a day. Uh, there was just a testimony in March uh, by the president of the NRDC testifying that the real cost of gas is $11 a gallon on just simple, honest accounting, not accounting for a lot of the sort of fuzzier costs, um, like environmental costs. But what we don't see at the pump, when we go to fill up our cars, we don't see this $50 billion that we spend on protecting the Persian Gulf oil supplies. We don't see the environmental or social costs affected by our choice to consume gasoline. There's no mention of the social degradation in Nigeria. There's no mention of particulate matter invading our children's lungs. So I think it's a really important thing to talk about. And if you can make a connection, which is really hard, but once you make that connection, then you can, <coughs> excuse me, you can propose a change. I can't picture a tobacco farmer in 1950 ever imagining Philip Morris running anti-smoking ads and funding programs to help people quit smoking. This was only made possible by sound science establishing connections between smoking and lung cancer. These connections are hard to establish, though. They take lots of time. They take lots of money. As an example, it was only just a few months ago that the Surgeon General concluded that secondhand smoke was indisputably unsafe. I mean, does anyone else find that astonishing? <laughs> it, it was actually 42 years ago that the first study was, the first report was issued by the, the Surgeon General in 1964 linking smoking to lung cancer. So step one was accomplished in 64. Step two took 42 years. So these connections are hard to make, but they're very critical to progress. But because they're so difficult, I think it's worth our, our time to consider their impacts and assess them thoroughly to ensure that we're making progress in the most efficient 
way possible towards our desired goals. So I think this is one connection that's worthy of focus. Um, imagine what would happen if more people knew the truth about how much we spend every year on oil, how much it really costs us as members of society. Uh, imagine a campaign similar to the campaign against tobacco companies highlighting the truth about tobacco. Many other countries have acknowledged the real cost of fossil fuels and have initiated massive campaigns to achieve sustainability. In Germany, for example, solar installations are receiving uh, 50 cents per kilowatt hour guaranteed for the next 20 years, which is a tremendously economical proposition, and it has hence created a, a global shortage in supply of uh, solar cells. In Brazil, for example, imported fossil fuel independence has now been achieved primarily due to a 20-year push to move sugarcane ethanol into the mainstream as a transportation fuel. Um, today you can find ethanol at every station in Brazil at a price sometimes half of that of fossil fuel. Uh, even in this country such change is possible. Uh, I personally drive a biodiesel car and last week I filled up with biodiesel at a commercial station in Los Angeles and it was the cheapest fuel at the station by over 20 cents a gallon. I think this is the most effective way to motivate consumers and affect change. So what it comes down to is levelizing the, the playing field, if that's a word, Level, leveling the playing field or levelizing. <laughs> so, so, it, so if, we, uh, if we assume for a moment that we can actually connect the dots, we can establish that the real cost of gasoline to the average customer is substantially more than what they pay at the pump. And there are many progressives out there talking about this, but I think that they're taking the wrong approach. Usually the response is to suggest that a gas tax should be implemented to subsidize alternatives. But it's suggested independently of, from any other tax legislation. It's nothing new to propose a gas tax um, to fund alternative fuels. Environmentalists have tried this for years and are trying still today. But what seems to be missing from these proposals is any attempt at fixing the fundamental problems with the system. The current situation is not the fault of the solar panel manufacturers and the biofuel technology companies. So why should we blame them by attaching the tax to their industry, by calling it an alternative fuel tax? I think we should call it what it really is. It's a tax for oil companies to subsidize their business and make it such a tax. So we all know and understand that oil companies need our help. So I'm sure that the tax will stand the test of time. But with this new tax in place, I'm just using random numbers just to suggest you know, a thought experiment, a concept. But say we implemented a $2 per gallon tax to pay for these oil company subsidies and military protections um, and no longer fed fund them federally. What would it do? Well, it, it would reduce our federal budget, just using simple math, by about $100 billion. Let's take half of that, $50 billion, and give it back. Um, cold cash rebates, everybody loves them it'd come out to roughly $300 per taxpayer every year. Maybe even more if you could do some more shuffling of some funds. What would that do? Well, you'd have $50 billion left over to spend on alternative energy research every year. <laughs> and what's more important, I think, is that, say gasoline was $5 a gallon, $50 billion would now go a very long way because you wouldn't have to subsidize alternatives much at all because they'd now be cost effective. Right? So you'd be able to spend most of it on technologies that make alternatives even cheaper and more efficient. And with alternatives now priced at less than gasoline, the demand for gasoline drops, reducing the pressure to build more polluting refineries and further subsidize the oil industry. It also drives the market towards innovative new products, specifically tailed for, tailored for alternative energy, which just further drives the cycle. So it might be a crazy concept, but all I'm really um, suggesting is that we start accounting for externalities and account for these external costs where they belong and let the market figure it out so that any lover of the free market can actually appreciate and buy into this concept. Uh, I think it's the only way that the goals of the environmental movement and the goals of business can truly and honestly become aligned. Uh, just another quick example, um, the same logic can be applied to the nuclear power industry. Uh, a lot of people, there's a new renewed push for nuclear power because there's low CO2 emissions so it's a chance for the industry to become revived. Uh, I say make them pay for their own terrorism insurance. It's a simple concept, but they're a business, they should pay for their own insurance. I bet if we implemented that policy, we would never see another plant built in this country. Why should I pay for a nuke plant's insurance as a taxpayer? Nobody's subsidizing the insurance I have to pay for my biodiesel production facility. 
Seems fair to me. So, in conclusion, um, I think we all talk about how high the stakes are, and I think that's a great quote. Uh, we start, have to start thinking outside of the box and coming up with new solutions. Um, but I don't want to sound, uh, end on a, on a down note, I don't want it to, to sound kind of doom and gloom that because the stakes are so high. I actually do think that we're at a tipping point. Um, there are lots of people in alternative energy that are succeeding. There's lots of stories of success. Uh, there's lots of money being poured into alternative energy. Bill Gates is investing heavily. Uh, Vinod Khosla, um, a lot of people coming out of the IT world are, are putting money into alternative energy, and these guys are winning, and there's, there's farmers in the Midwest making money, making biofuels, and it's a good thing for everyone, and so I think it's a, it's a, it's a time to be optimistic because I think with oil prices where they are and, and as high as they're gonna be into the foreseeable future, I think there's a lot of opportunities that can be spawned out of this time. So I, I think it's, uh, it's an optimistic time, and um, I'm excited to, uh, to be a part of it. So that's all.